All right, so that's me. Uh, my store is located on 29 North. Uh, it's in the, it, our shopping little sh uh, strip center parking lot adjoins the one where Staples and Jason's Deli is. There's a Starbucks in there, which most people are familiar with, uh, and a couple other stores, music store and a mattress store, and then there's mine. So let's start with a basic question. I mean, why bother? Why feed the birds? You know, it is helpful to the birds. Uh, there's not a whole lot of research out there that, you know, good kind of um, control research about feeding the birds versus not feeding the birds. But there's at least one study that was done really well that uh, fed gold, you know, they, they did, they fed goldfinches in one natural area and then in another one, which is pretty much identical, they did not. And they found that the uh, ones that had access to food uh, over the summer entered into the fall healthier. So it's a, it's a good idea. It's just, I mean, it kind of is, is common sense too, right? I mean, if you, if you know that you have a reliable source of food, then that is going to help you survive and, um, and, and thrive. This is, a, this is something that I really believe, and obviously my customers do. You know, it's a constantly renewing source of beauty, beauty interest, and pleasure. You know, I see things all the time, and I've, that I hadn't seen before, and I've been watching the birds for a long time. You know, I, I joke with my customers that there are lots of things in this world that are relaxing, and there are lots of things in this world that are really engaging. I have generally found that the relaxing things tend to be more like shell out and not super engaging, and the engaging things tend to be kind of hyper-focused and not relaxing. For me, uh, watching the birds, uh, it's both. And this is something, you know, especially with COVID, um, it has been a real comfort to me and to my customers, frankly to know that we're part of something bigger and to sit on your porch and watch nature go about her normal course of business while ours is uh, disrupted for the time being and a little unnerving. Uh, it's brought me tremendous uh, peace and comfort and it's done the same for my customers. And finally, you know, it's easy. It's just not that hard. There are some uh, challenges that one might encounter, but none of them are insurmountable. And we'll touch on some of those uh, shortly. All right, so there aren't too many ingredients that are uh, required to create a bird supportive environment. Good, good high quality food, and I'm gonna talk about that in just a moment, because not all bird foods are created equal. Uh, appropriately designed, well-maintained feeders. I will say that most of the time, if somebody comes and says, you know, the birds don't like my feeder. It's not the feeder, it's the food. Almost every single time there's an issue with the food that's going into the feeder and not the feeder itself. That's not 100% true. There are feeders that are poorly designed. The perches might be too small, for instance, so it's hard for the birds to land on them. Um, but most feeders are going to work okay. Water, uh, I got to tell you, you know, watching a bird in a bird bath is absolutely just a, a, a complete joy. It's so much fun. Shelter, um, I'm not going to talk about bird boxes, although if uh, there is a question afterwards, I'll be happy to address it. Uh, but, you know, we have a lot of people who put up bird houses. Uh, bluebird houses are far and away the most popular ones. Uh, but also, you know, the plantings around your house. I, mean, I can't tell you the number of birds I got rustling around in our boxwoods. Uh, native plants. You know, I, I think ornamentals are great. Uh, but I think that planting native plants is a critically, critically important thing to do. Uh, and I will come back to that. Uh, momentarily. All right, so uh, bird feeding success starts with great food. So what you are looking at here are uh, two blends that we have in the store. One has a mixture of uh, shells that have the bird seed on the, I'm sorry, food that has a shell on it, 
a predominantly black oil sunflower seed and there's some peanuts and some safflower seed in there. And then the other one is one where all the shells have been removed. Uh, I have plenty of customers who live in situations where they don't want shells on the ground. They might be in dense living uh, quarters or uh, they just don't want to be cleaning off their porch or patio uh, or they don't want the tannin in the black oil killing foliage and they don't want sunflowers growing in their yard necessarily. All right, so if you ask me, what are the three most important things to put into a bird food? Number one is black oil sunflower seed. This is the food that is eaten by most of the birds. It mimics uh, the seeds that are readily found uh, in nature. Uh, pretty much every single, every single bird that comes to feeders in our part of the world eats black oil sunflower seed. It, so it, it forms the, the core of all of our blends. That is sunflower seed that's been re removed from the shell. Um, I either like to use completely hulled seeds or a blend where you've got some uh, seed in the shell and some out of the shell. Your smaller birds, like your goldfinches in particular, and your bluebirds, they love sunflower seeds. It's easier for them to eat the ones that have already been removed from the shell. And then the last ingredient for me is, is nuts. So those are peanuts. We have blends that have peanuts and tree nuts and all kinds of things in them. Uh, great source of fat for the birds. Uh, in, in particular, you know, your woodpeckers and your nut hatches really love nuts, but uh, most birds uh, eat, eat it and enjoy it uh, greatly, including chickadees and titmice and the like. All right, so I'm gonna talk about two bird seeds. One is called millet. Uh, millet is a good, a very good bird seed. It's a specialty seed, predominantly eaten by your ground feeders. Um, so a lot of your perching birds will just pick it out of the feeder and throw it onto the ground. But it's good. I would never buy a bird seed that's mostly made up of millet, but it's a nice addition to a bird seed. This is called Milo. Never buy a bag of bird seed that has Milo in it. Milo is sorghum seed. Our birds don't eat it. It might look like they're eating it, but what they're really doing is taking it and picking it out and throwing it on the ground. Uh, it's a waste of money, and a lot of your very, very inexpensive blends will have a lot of this in there. And you might be paying very little for your bag of bird seed, but if 60% of it or 70% of it is filler, and there are other fillers like corn, then you're not getting your money's worth. So let's move on, talk about some different types of feeders. This is the most common one. It's a, a regular seed tube feeder. It's great, very uh, all purpose. Most birds have no trouble landing on it. Some of your larger birds, it can take them a while to get used to the perches, um, including cardinals. Cardinals will learn how to, uh, to feed out of one of these tube feeders, but it can take uh, a while for them to learn. But they're great, they hold a good bit of bird food, they're very easy to maintain. Hopper feeders. Hopper feeders are great because uh, it, it, it provides more of an area for your larger birds to eat. They can hold a whole bunch of bird food. Uh, the only challenge with hopper feeders is oftentimes they are pole, mount pole mounted, so it's not, it, it can be a little bit uh, more of a challenge to refill them depending on how high up it is, or if you need to take your feeders in at night because of things like bears, which we'll get to later, um, that can present a bit of a challenge as well. Tray feeders. Uh, tray feeders, I think, are wonderful. I have that, that plastic one that you see over there. It's called a dinner bell. Uh, I love it. It's great because it's a very natural way for birds to eat. Uh, and by the way, that is not a picture of my dinner bell, but I have had four bluebirds at one time eating out of, out of that feeder. Um, it, it, you, you do tend to have to refill them more frequently. Uh, and if you've got a squirrel, you know, you can't use that if you've got a, a squirrel problem that you've not defended against. Uh, but we come back to that uh, as well. Cylinder feeders. So this, I have two of these. I absolutely love them. What I like is that as you can see in the pictures, you know, sometimes the birds will cling right to the bird, to the bird food and eat it, uh, that, especially your woodpeckers but uh, other birds have places where they can perch. It takes them a little time. So they're looking for what they want out of that cylinder. They're pecking at it, they're, and then they're flying away. 
Uh, they also last a good long while, so you can put out a cylinder and they they hold up really well uh, and you know might be out there for a week or two and that's fine. Uh, I put them out you know, back in the days when we could go on vacation. Uh, I would put a couple big ones out uh, because I feel guilty when I get home from vacation and the feeders are empty. So uh, they're good they're good for that as well. Window feeders. Uh, lots of people, uh, multi-unit kinds of situations. Uh, I've got a lot of uh, a lot of customers who really like window feeders. We've got ones that are like this for seed. We've got ones that are uh, for for hummingbirds. I've got a lot of customers who started feeding the birds because they wanted to entertain their cats, and so this is what they would get and put it on the window uh, so that their cats could watch the birds. And then over time, the humans came to realize that that was kind of a fun activity for them as well. Niger feeders. So goldfinches like a, love a bird seed called niger. But as I said before, they also love uh, sunflower seeds, particularly hulled sunflower seeds. Uh, but a niger feeder is a specialized feeder for this little tiny seed that actually is not grown domestically. It, uh, all of it comes from Ethiopia and India. Uh, it is not um, thistle. A lot of people call it thistle, but it's it's actually not. It's a it's a different seed. It's treated so that when it comes over here, nothing uh, bad is going to grow out of it. Uh, but they the the birds certainly do love it, and it mimics like if you look at the little seeds in a cone flower, uh, it doesn't. It, it looks very similar to that. And on the right, this is just a or I, I don't know if on my right, there's a mesh one fun because the birds crawl all over it. The other one is one with perches. You know, the goldfinches will show up in giant mobs, uh, pig out, and then they just kind of disappear for a while. Uh, but they, they, they do come back. Suet feeders. Uh, these are oftentimes designed for clinging birds. Here you have a pileated woodpecker and a red-bellied woodpecker eating on two different styles of suet feeders. But lots and lots of different birds love suet. Bluebirds like suet. They don't really cling to eat like that. Um, your wrens, your catbirds, your mockingbirds, they all go crazy for suet. There's a, a great little bird around here in the wintertime called a ruby-crowned kinglet that uh, also loves to cling and eat suet. Uh, so it, this is a real fun feeder uh, as well, and just a, in, a, a really different kind of style. Nectar and fruit feeders. So uh, you, there you've got the hummingbird feeder. I'm sure I'm gonna have a question about hummingbirds later on. Uh, it, it always seems slow, the hummingbird arrival. You know, people see the first one and they get very excited and then they don't see any for a couple of weeks and then they get very worried. But really, it, um, it's, once the moms and the, and the young are out towards the middle, towards the end, towards the middle and late part of the summer, there will be plenty. And on the right is the oriole feeder. I put, <laughs> I put an Oriole feeder up every year and I have never seen an Oriole, but I at, at, at my feeder, but I still do it, you know, hope springs eternal. They like fruit and nectar. The, they actually drink nectar similar to what hummingbirds drink, except it's six parts water to one part sugar instead of four parts water to one part sugar. They also eat seeds. Uh, all right, so water and bird baths. You know, I just cannot, recommend more highly getting a bird bath. Uh, it is so much fun to watch a bird get in the middle of a bath and just splash around like crazy. What you see here is a little attachment on one of our uh, baths that you can either set to drip or mist. And hummingbirds really obviously, that is not a Photoshop. That is an actual picture of an actual hummingbird doing that. Um, water also, I mean, incredibly important for the birds as you can imagine. Uh, both in terms of hydration and cleanliness. And, uh, and there are birds that commonly don't go to feeders that love a bird bath. I mean, the American robin is uh, at the top of the list for me in that sense. You know, they just get in there and make a giant mess splashing around. Uh, oftentimes, you know, if I get two or three in there in a succession, I got to go and refill the bird bath because they splash it all over the place. Brown thrashers are not common feeder birds. They love to take a bird bath. Um, I've had, you know, a, a northern flicker in, in, my, in my bird bath before, as well as chipmunks and squirrels and things like that. So uh, it's a wonderful addition. Native plants. 
I didn't know this until I read a book by Doug Ptolemy called Bringing Nature Home, which is a great, a great read if you're interested in these kinds of things. Uh, it makes a, a lot of sense, but I just didn't know. So obviously plants of all kinds, bushes will, can provide shelter, nesting spots, and uh, fruiting uh, trees and bushes can provide food. But the birds don't just eat the berries, obviously, right? They, they eat, um, they're not most, the only all entirely vegetarian feeder bird that we have is the goldfinch. All the other birds, including your hummingbirds, eat insects. And uh, non-native plants don't support insect populations, which makes sense, you know, because the insects evolved to feed off of the plants that were proximal to them. Yeah, so they don't have a taste for plants that are coming from other parts of the world. And so insects don't live on them, and which uh, reduces the amount of insect food there is for a bird in a particular microenvironment, let's say. Now, I'm not saying go out and plant only natives. I got all kinds of stuff in my yard, but I do, uh, but I do have plenty of natives specifically for that reason. This is a cedar waxling which is an absolutely stunning bird. It, it doesn't even look real. It looks like somebody painted it, but that is actually what they look like. Uh, they uh, go crazy for uh, trees like serviceberry. That's, I believe, a serviceberry tree. And they will show up in large mobs, gorge themselves on fruit, and then move on to the next tree. I, I had, you know, 20 in this uh, tree next to my house. I, I'm not exactly sure what it is, I'm afraid. Um, about uh, last week. All right, so this is a section where I'm just going to go through some slides and, and uh, point out some of our very common feeder birds here in central Virginia. Uh, it'll go relatively quickly. Uh, this uh, clearly is a ruby-throated hummingbird. That is the male. The male is the one with the ruby throat. The female is uh, more drab. They um, are, you know, they get here middle of April and are here, you know, until late September, early October. They migrate all the way up into Canada. It's, a, it's remarkable to me because uh, they have to fly across the Gulf of Mexico. It's a, an incredible journey for such a small bird. When they're mating, uh, the males will do these great parabolic uh, dances and their wing speeds can reach 200, uh, 200 beats a second. Is that right? No, 200 beats a Ah, I think, I can't remember. It's a lot, let's put it that way. Yeah, I think it's 200 beats a second. Uh, this is a chickadee. This is a chickadee in winter. It looks like a uh, cotton ball. That's because it's puffed itself up to create a barrier between its skin and the cold air. You know, we all like down comforters for a reason. This is also a chickadee. So you can get a sense of <laughs> just how different they look. You got the cotton ball chickadee and the summertime chickadee. Uh, the, ours are the Carolina chickadees. There are some black cap chickadees. They look almost identical and they do interbreed. Uh, blue jays, uh, uh, they're somewhat a controversial bird. I love them. I think they're smart. Uh, they do tend to monopolize feeders from time to time. When they come swooping in, the other ones zip away. You've got your uh, male and female cardinal. Um, Lovely, I mean, obviously lovely bird. State is the state bird of seven states, uh, including ours. The Eastern Bluebird, much beloved, that's the male. Uh, you know, if you put up a Bluebird box, the same couple will have as many as uh, two, three, occasionally four different broods in there. Uh, and then they take the babies and they go do stuff. And then the babies and the parents tend to come back. So you've got like the, the baby birds and the parent birds go into your feeders and your bird bath and you can watch them all like learning how to hunt bugs. Uh, it's, it's just great fun. Uh, American goldfinch, that's the goldfinch, in, that's the male in its summer plumage. They, they don't migrate. So, I mean, they move around a lot. So if you see goldfinches in the morning and then you see goldfinches in the evening at your feeders, they may very well, very well be entirely different set of goldfinch. Uh, it's goldfinches. They just, they move around a lot, but they don't migrate in the traditional sense of the word. So, but the males in particular, their plumage is so drab in the wintertime that a lot of my customers, 
think that they've all gone because the male goldfinch doesn't really look anything like the um, the the summer male goldfinch and the winter male goldfinch don't look anything alike. That is a uh, male house finch. That is a white-breasted nuthatch, uh, nicknamed the upside down bird because it spends a lot of its time upside down. Uh, just incredibly charming, delightful bird with a, a, a muted uh, kind of soft call. I can't do bird calls, and so I'm, I'm not even gonna try. Tufted titmouse, you put up a bird feeder. It is uh, not at all uncommon for the tufted titmouse to be the first ones to show up. Um, opportunistic, wonderful birds. This is a, I believe that's a hairy. It's a little hard to tell the difference between the hairy and the downy woodpeckers. I've got a hairy and a downy in here and you'll see. Uh, they look a lot alike. Uh, that, I believe that's a hairy woodpecker. That's a pileated woodpecker. The big one looks a little bit like a pterodactyl because of that red crest. Uh, that is a northern flicker. And the, the flickers you often see on the, on the ground. They, are a, uh, they spend a lot of time on the ground looking for, for bugs, uh, more so than banging away on the side of trees. That is the downy, uh, a little bit smaller than a hairy. The bill is a little bit smaller in proportion to its head. It's eating suet. That's a spreadable suet that you can put onto a tree. Suet is just, it's rendered beef fat, and then oftentimes um, it'll have the addition of nuts, ground mealworms, all kinds of delicious things if you're a bird. That is a, a red-bellied woodpecker. And again, you can see the suet over there, and down in the lower co corner is either a hairy or a downy. There's that beautiful ruby crown kinglet that I mentioned earlier that is here in the winter time and likes to go to feeders. Smaller than a goldfinch. Uh, if you look carefully, the male will have that tuft of uh, bright red on the top of its head. White-throated sparrow, they are wintertime residents as well. Uh, love millet, that bird seed I pointed out earlier for ground feeders. Uh, that is a dark-eyed junco, also one of our winter visitors. All right, let's talk about frustrations. Number one on the list of frustrations are squirrels. Uh, if somebody comes into my store and the first words out of their mouth are, I have a problem, it's almost certain that the next words out of their mouth are going to relate to squirrels. Squirrels think about nothing uh, but getting to your bird food and procreating. So, however, the good news is that there are great solutions for dealing with squirrels. And I will say most of my customers, really, they don't, it's not that they hate squirrels. A lot of my customers feed squirrels, but they wanna feed them on their own terms, not on the squirrel's terms. So here you've got um, a squirrel resistant feeder. The way that this one works is you see there's a cage on the, out, on the outside, and then uh, there's a plastic tube on the inside. The weight of the squirrel shuts that entire cage. So that entire cage slides up and down. So the way, the way to the squirrel uh, slides the cage down around the port so it can't get to the food anymore. All of my squirrel uh, resistant feeders work basically, this, well, they all work the same way, that the, they're the same uh, basic concept. This, however, is my very favorite way to defend um, feeders from squirrels. If you can put a pole in the ground and have that pole eight to 10 feet away from walls, trees, fence lines, leaping off points. Then you can put this device, these are both baffles. It needs to go about five feet off the ground. The squirrel can climb up the pole, but it can't get around that baffle. So you can put whatever kind of feeder you want to above it, and it's safe. Uh, this, all of my poles are baffled. It's the best thing in the world. So um, for people who are, aren't able to do that and who don't have a squirrel-proof feeder, hot pepper foods are a good solution. Birds lack, lack the receptors for capsaicin, uh, which is the compound that makes chili pepper hot. Um, squirrels, like you and I, uh, have that receptor. And so they will steer clear of bird food that has hot pepper in it. It doesn't hurt the squirrels, it's just not pleasant. Uh, and, and for the birds, they have no idea doesn't impact their taste buds or their digest digestive tracts or anything like that. All right, another challenge can be raccoons. This 
picture was taken by one of my customers and this poor mama raccoon was used to climbing up that pole and getting food. And I guess she didn't look up before she climbed the pole because she got, she got to the top of it and um, my customer had already removed the feeders. Uh, raccoons are diabolical because they are smart. They will work in teams and they have opposable thumbs so they can grab stuff. Uh, the good news is they're with rare exception, nocturnal. They're pretty reliably nocturnal. And so um, if you take your feeders in at night, then you're likely to be just fine. Bears, this is a, this is a big challenge around here. Uh, I had no idea how many bears we had in Charlottesville prior to buying the store. This picture is also from one of my customers. And uh, this is a mama bear who has two cubs with her. Uh, the, there are other pictures of her with her cubs on the ground. And she climbed up, she's about 14 feet in the air, and she has wedged herself in between those two trees so that she can use her paws to um, pull that bird feeder over. Uh, bears, you know, they are predominantly nocturnal, but it is not uncommon for them to show up during the day. Best thing to do is take your food in at night. Um, you know, if there is a, a real problem in the neighborhood, taking your feeders down for a couple of weeks isn't a bad idea. Um, we've, had pay, we've had customers use hot pepper food to kind of bait the bears, because the bears don't like it either. And so if they get a big bite of a hot pepper cylinder, uh, the, the idea is that they will, it'll imprint that this is not where they want to go eat, because they're very smart uh, animals. And, and I love them. They're smart, they're beautiful, they're extremely uh, agile. I do sell a pole that is bear proof. Uh, it's a big investment, and, but we've got other strategies that we've helped people with as well. Unwanted birds, that's a European starling. And just so you know, so the European starling, the way that bird got here is there was a group of Shakespearean enthusiasts who decided that they wanted to release one of each species of bird or uh, a representative collection of each species of bird that appears in a Shakespearean play. I don't know what happened to the rest of them, but the European starlings have thrived. Um, starlings and this next bird, that's a grackle. Uh, they don't really like safflower seed, which is a relative of the sunflower seed. They tend to steer clear of it, so if you end up with real big um, problems with those birds and other blackbirds, for whatever reason, safflower is not their favorite. Um, you know, there are also cages that you can put around feeders that will keep the larger birds out. The issue with that is, you know, there is no cage that will keep out a starling that will allow a cardinal, for instance, to go in and eat. So these, you know, I, oftentimes we recommend a combination of strategies to when it comes to the birds that you don't want around your feeders. Ah, 32 minutes, that's pretty good. So we're, we're <laughs> We're on to questions, and uh, I'm, yeah, I'd be happy to field as many as people want. So, Carolyn, what should I do as far as my screen is concerned now? Thank you. If you go to the top and hit stop share. All right. I will do that. There we go. And All right. Now, so, now this, is a, uh, this is a very, that was very enjoyable. It's a lot more enjoyable when you can actually see your audience because you have zero idea, you know, how you're, <laughs> how you're doing when you're just looking uh, at a computer screen. So I hope there are a few questions. So, yeah, if you have a question, uh, Barbara, yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. Okay, you were mentioning about the Niger and the thistle. Mm -hmm. What is the difference? because I was confused whenever I go in the shop, you know, what is the difference? So I can't talk to you about the difference as far as, you know, botanically, but they are just different seeds from different plants. Uh, Niger is actually a trade name. Uh, I, and I cannot tell you the name of the plant that the seed comes from, to be honest, but it is not the same as thistle and it's not uh, an invasive in the way that thistle is. Niger is also, um, and, and people will still call it thistle. And if somebody walks in the store and says, I'm looking for a bag of thistle, I know exactly what they want, and we get them a, a bag of Niger. Um, it's, it's heat treated to prevent 
any kind of germination uh, and also to prevent anything traveling over from those other countries that might get mixed in with the, with the niger. So I'm sorry, it's probably not a very satisfying answer, but they're just different seeds from different plants. Okay, the niger is the one that comes from overseas. Is that yeah. right? Yes, okay. it comes from Ethiopia and India. So is a, would you say that it's better for the thistle then? I- They like it better or? Well, I've never, so I've never fed thistle and I've never sold thistle. So I can't. I bought thistle from you. You've only ever bought Niger. Okay. Yeah. So what you, if you come into the store the next time, when you look down at the bags, you'll see that it says Niger. Now on the small bags, it says thistle slash Niger because so many people know this, know the seed as thistle. Okay. Ah, I'm sorry. I've made things more confusing than they need to be. It is the, it, the seed that you see in my store that is little tiny and black, and yeah. that is what the goldfinches want. Okay. Anybody else have a question? Okay, I have another question then. <laughs> All right, I was, was going to say because I have to go do yard work when this is over. So okay. I'm hoping that there's at least a couple more questions. Okay, uh, baffle. The baffle baffles me uh, because we have the squirrels that are going on top of the baffle to get up to the nest or okay. the feeder. Most of the time, if a squirrel is able, so you have a baffle that is on your pole, so it's attached to your pole. Yes. Okay. Most of the time, if that's happening, uh, one of two things is occurring. Either the pole is close enough to, again, a wall or a tree or a bush, something that a squirrel can jump from, because they have that eight to 10 foot, 10 is a lot, but you know, certainly eight feet, they can jump from, uh, horizontally from one place to another, or the baffle is too low. So the squirrels have about a four foot vertical leap. So if the bottom of the baffle isn't five feet off the ground, then uh, sometimes they can jump on, to on top of it that way. Okay, thank you. Sometimes people have bionic squirrels. I mean, I've seen squirrels do amazing things. Uh, you know, so every once in a while you got one that maybe can jump a little higher. Okay, the one other one they have is a service berry tree. Uh-huh. Uh, how large would that get? I am going to defer to the internet on that question. Uh, okay. I don't want to give you an incorrect answer. They don't get, they're not huge trees. But, you know, there, and there are other ones. So there's like, uh, I planted a, a, a miniature crab apple. I can't uh, maybe or a dwarf crab apple. I can't remember what it's called, but you know, I, I you, you'll be able to find out the maximum height of these trees pretty pretty easily just by looking them up. I'm, that's not, you know, I'm not an expert in that. Okay. Uh, somebody somebody asked where my store was. Uh, my store is on uh, so it's 29 North. It's near the intersection of Rio Road and um, Route 29. It's our, our shopping center is right next to the one that has staples in it. Uh, it's across the street. Uh, it's on the other side of 29 from Fashion Square Mall. There's a Starbucks in our little strip center. I have a question about the window feeder. Sure. Um, is When you put it on your window, is that not a risk for birds flying into the window? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, it probably would help as a deterrent. Most of the time, if a bird flies into a window, there's one of two things happening. Um, it's seeing the reflection of the trees behind it and thinks that it can fly, it thinks that it's flying into the trees when it's really flying into your window. Uh, so something that disrupts that illusion for the bird or that reflection 
uh, would actually help it to know that it's not going to fly into the trees. Uh, we also sell a, a, these decals that um, uh, are ultraviolet, so the birds see in, uh, into the ultraviolet light range that people will put on their windows for the exact same purpose. The other behavior is when birds see their own reflection and just peck at the window. Uh, that's a territorial behavior, which is much more difficult to deal with than birds you know, thinking they can fly through a window. So I, I would think that a window feeder would actually make it less likely that a bird would fly into the window because it's gonna see the food and know that it's gonna land there. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. So Scott, there was a question. Uh, I don't know if this is in your area of expertise, but how do you deter a woodpecker pecking on your house? So that, uh, that is another difficult one. So, and there's different kinds of woodpecker behaviors, right? So if you have a woodpecker that's trying to make a nest in your house, that's a big problem because it's gonna be a big hole. Sometimes they're looking for bugs. So if you've got cedar, shingles and you've got a woodpecker who's really interested in a particular area of your house you might have want to have somebody come out and take a look because it um because it could be looking for bugs which means that there's you know some degradation to that to that wood uh, then the other is just sort of territorial behavior i'm making this noise so that you other woodpeckers know that this is my space um it, and it you know there the interventions range from putting up um, like a hardware cloth, if it's over one specific area, putting up hardware cloth or something like that to make it more difficult and unpleasant for the bird to do that. Um, putting up like mylar um, reflective string or tape is actually what it's called, uh, can help. Um, but there's, you know, there, there's not a lot of great solutions, I'm afraid. Putting an owl up, you know, some people do that, but unless the owl is kind of animatronic and moves around a little bit, the birds, they learn that the owl is not real. But the, the tape, like scare tape is, is, is what we have in the store. Um, that might work. And if it's a very limited area, just anything that you can do to obstruct the bird's access to that area. If it's going all over your house, then that's a much bigger challenge i'm afraid is there like a woodpeckers uh service thing? <laughs> you know, who do you who do you get to to deal with that you know if it is a bigger problem it's uh, it's interesting i mean nobody's ever asked me you know do you, can you recommend a woodpecker removal <laughs> guy uh so i don't have a clear answer to that question actually you know, right. I, and and it's yeah, I mean, it would be hard. I mean, it's going to be hard to trap a woodpecker and, and, and relocate a woodpecker. So I, I don't think that there are going to be a whole lot of people who do that because my guess is that it probably is not very lucrative because it takes forever to capture one. Well, I hope the person who asked that question, it's a limited place and some scare tape works. Yeah. <laughs> there was another question on the chat. What is the best feeder to attract bluebirds? My very favorite feeder to attract the bluebird is that clear one that you saw. That's a tray style feeder called the dinner bell. Um, now, the, and what, what is important is that it's a tray style feeder. And my bluebirds go to my, my other feeders as well. I feel like they like that tray style feeder the best and they will sort of congregate there in some numbers. And remember the really important thing with the bluebirds is uh, to put out a bird food that's got some hulled sunflower seeds in there because that's, that's what they really like. Um, they like dried mealworms. This time of year when they're feeding their young, they don't feed their young dried mealworms so much. So we sell live mealworms for that purpose. But and, you know, if you, if you make like a little mix of food, having something that's got some mealworms, a little bit, some suet balls and uh, some hulled sunflower seeds. That's the combination that I put in my feeder that seems to be very, you know, well liked by the bluebirds and lots of others. Great. Anybody else? Any questions or comments? Sounds like a lot of us uh, have some bird feeders in our already and maybe some of you are considering. 
Here's another question. We're in a townhouse, not enough space for a feeder. Have spread squirrel food and black wall. Birds fight for it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, a window style feeder is a, a, a possibility for a, a townhome. Um, this time of year, I mean, you could, if you've got a potted plant, you can get a little steak and put a small hummingbird feeder right inside of a potted plant for that. Um, the suet, the hanging suet feeders, some of them are actually very, very small. They're just designed to take a cake that I would say is maybe five inches by five inches or six inches, six inches by six inches. So there are some smaller feeders that might work for that situation or a window feeder. I have something. Yeah. Um, I bought a hummingbird feeder from you. It's sort of like, it, it, you had a picture of it there. Um, yeah. Uh, the pie one, sort of. Looks like a flying saucer. Wonderful, wonderful thing. I'll tell you, I mean, of working with the boiling of the water and all that, you know, and cleaning it all the time, but that feeder is so much nicer and it has a well in the middle of it you know, for water so all the ants don't go after it. So I really, you know, would, you know, tell people about that thing. Well, I'm delighted it's working well for you. That's one of our go-to feeders for the hummingbirds uh, in no small part because it is super easy to use and easy to yeah. keep clean. And that built-in ant mode is a real nice feature. Yeah. Okay. That's what I hear. Um, I have a question. Okay. Uh, okay. So I got a, a squirrel proof bird feeder and at first I was really enamored watching the squirrels try to get in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and now I'm just really annoyed with the squirrels because there's, I don't know how many that constantly try to get in and they're always at the bottom, of course, eating the seed that, that falls. And, um, you know, it's, it's relaxing and engaging and annoying. And um, I think my husband's quite frankly ready to move the feeder or move the squirrels. And I wondered if you had any suggestions. So, you know, over time, the squirrels should learn that they're not gonna be able to get into that feeder. They'll still try periodically. Um, if you use a blend of bird seed that doesn't have shells on it, I'm not sure what you're using, but that will reduce the kind of detritus that's underneath the feeder that will be attractive to squirrels. But to be honest with you, with those squirrel proof feeders, you know, they're not designed to convince the squirrels not to try. I mean, they're designed to prevent the squirrels from getting into the feeder. So I don't know how long a squirrel's memory is, but um, you know, I, my guess is that they give up and then they forget. And then they're like, oh, look, there's a feeder. And they try it again, or else you got new squirrels that show up. Um, you could try hot pepper foods inside of the feeder because that would certainly leave an imprint. Uh, so if you did that for a couple of iterations, that is that could possibly help. You know, again, my thing is if you can put a pole in the ground and get it in the right place and put a baffle on the pole, yeah, that is the number one, that is the best way to do it by far. Mm -hmm. And make sure there's no jumping from the trees. Right. As well. Right. And you right. said it's yeah. what, eight to 10 feet? Is eight that right? To, yep. Eight to 10 feet. Okay. All right. I have a funny one about that. As I bought that one too, the one that the squirrel, you know, with the weight of it shuts it down. Yeah. But this, this one time the squirrel got all the way up to the top of it because he couldn't get in the S way. And so upside down, he went and tried <laughs> to get it like upside down. So he didn't put his weight on the, you know, little uh, perch. Uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and but he tried, but he still didn't get it. And that was the only other time that we had a squirrel, you know, get in or try to get into that feeder. Well, that I mean, funny, if, you know. if you spent almost all of your time trying to figure out how to get into somebody else's food <laughs> or how, and how to get into a feeder, you come up with some pretty good, you know, you probably come up with some pretty clever and unique 
mm -hmm. uh, approaches. The other thing about those feeders is they do need to be 18 inches away from a place where a squirrel could grab on to one thing and reach over and grab the feeder. Otherwise, like, yeah. Yeah, because it's just going to pull the feeder and shake food out of it or stick its mouth in there without having to really put weight on the feeder. Those, those feeders are designed to work when the weight of the squirrel is on it. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely works. It, it it's more the squirrel's um, yeah. tenacity that's the th yeah. the sticking point. But maybe maybe with time they'll learn well, <laughs> or not. Have some sort of genetic intervention here in the future. <laughs> right. I have a question. Um, your your pole feeder that's eight to ten feet high and with the baffle on it. Tell me how you uh, change the add food. So the the poles that we sell once they're in the ground, the hooks tend to be about seven feet, oh, six and a half to seven feet off the ground. And then of course, especially if you're talking about a tube style feeder, you've got another couple of feet worth of you know eighteen inches to a couple of feet worth of feeders. So most people can actually, you know, reach the bottom of one of those feeders and get it off a hook. I've got a couple of customers who can't, but most people are able to do that. Uh, we sell a reacher as well. That's a kind of a clever little d device that um, I think it's maybe three feet, three and a half feet long that you can use to reach up and grab the, the feeders. Uh, it's, a, it's a little harder using a device like that when you've got a bird feeder full of food that's bearing a little weight but um, but it's a it's an effective device if you have a feeder that's mounted to a, the top of a pole that that's high that is that high that's that's where it gets tricky for sure does that answer your question yes okay <laughs> Looking in the chat, I see a thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments? I have to say, Scott, oh, I see Sue, are you waving? Oh no, okay. Um, <laughs> somebody's unmuting, there you go. Waving goodbye. Oh, okay, <laughs> thank you. My name is Sue, how do you do? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just, you know, people have names come up and yeah, oftentimes yeah. it's, yeah, and welcome. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> <laughs>